I appreciate the time to hear House File 443, which is a bill that seeks to increase the maximum student loan credit. And, and, and as Chair Gomez stated, this is a really important bill. Um, when our current student loan tax credit was uh, included in the 2017 omnibus bill, Minnesota was the first in the nation to act at the state level. At that time, we were trying to address our nation's uh, crushing student loan debt issue, uh, issue which was $1.36 trillion at that time. And in just five years, the amount has increased to $1.75 trillion. So student loan debt is projected to only increase. I'm not sure how many of you on this committee know this, but um, Chair Davids actually uh, was the uh, person who led this work and uh, around this innovative student loan work. And I want to build on his legacy and the work that he has done. And I want to acknowledge that uh, the work that he put into this. I vote aye. <laughs> <laughs> and what I want to do is that, you know, uh, chairs, uh, uh, chair and members, um, that I'd like to, uh, with this bill, we want to modify the existing student loan tax credit in three ways. And uh, the first is that we're, we, I'd like to see the increase of the maximum credit from $500 to $5,000. And we all know that in tax credits, it's money back into the pockets of individuals. So instead of issuing them a check, this is pretty much as good as putting money back into their pockets. Uh, increase the income base phase out from $10,000 to $50,000. And also modify the earned income limitations. Um, and so, you know, that means that people, depending on their, their level of uh, income, will get some kind of credit for this up to a certain income level. And so um, those are the modifications that are being looked to be made. Um, in 2019, there were 50,000. I'm just going to provide a little bit back. I'm sure you all already know this, but since these, this, these were the only two bills being heard, I'm going to give a little bit more background and statistics on some of this. But in 2019, 50,900 Minnesotans benefited from the current uh, credit. And under this new bill, um, there would be 132,400 additional Minnesotans would be eligible. And in Minnesota, student loan borrows uh, uh, Student loan borrowers totaled 775,600, owing $27.1 billion. That's just Minnesota's numbers. The average student loan debt load is $30,894 for state students. So students who go to pri who have to take out private debt is usually a lot more than I saw, anywhere from like eight to ten thousand dollars more if you uh, have private loan debt. Uh, nearly a quarter of the students uh, loan borrowers live in rural communities across the state. Um, addressing the exploding student loan debt is not just about relief, but it is also an equity issue. Um, black and African American college graduates owe an average of $25,000 more in student loan debt than white college graduates. Four years after graduating, 48% of black students owing an average of 6% more than they borrowed. Hispanics and Latino students are the second most likely to borrow high amounts from private sources. So they're not even doing the federal and what is available to them. 69.4% of Hispanic and Latino students who use private loans borrow $40,000 more than uh, the average of you know, about $30,000. Addressing this issue matters because studies have shown that student loan debt has negative impacts on home ownership, marriage, and birth rates, enrollment in postgraduate education, and increases the probability of parental cohabitation for longer periods post-graduation. I want to focus on one particular point, and that is birth rate. I'm sure that many of you in different communities you've been in have heard from the demographer about what is happening here in Minnesota, is that we are not having as many children to sort of fill the need for our workforce shortage problem. <clears throat> this issue will only get worse if we do not do anything to attract and retain young, uh, educated workers. Whether you went to a private college or you went to school in state or out of state or took out public or private loans, what this bill does is encourage those who are college educated to move to Minnesota to work, live, spend, start a family, and thrive. Chair, there is more I could say about this because this issue is also really important to me as a first-gen college student, as somebody who had to pay my own way, and there were weeks in which I didn't eat, and I didn't know that was called food insecurity back then because I was paying for my own college. Um, you know, there's so much more I could say about why uh, this type of bill is important to encourage people to go to college and how do we help them afterwards, but we have a lot of testifiers here today, and with your permission, I would like to turn it over to my first testifier. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Representative Her. I, I forgot to do the actual um, thing that we do in committee, and so I just want to move that House File 443 is laid over for a possible inclusion in a future omnibus tax bill. Thank you. Um, and just uh, before we move to testifiers, uh, Representative Swidzinski, did you have a question? If it's, if it's sort of a general bill kind of like discussion question, we're going to hold it till after the testifiers, but you're welcome to go ahead. Okay, sounds good. We'll do. Um, all right, so first um, is Adam Thompson here. Welcome. Could you come up, uh, introduce yourself for the record, and go ahead with your testimony? Thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the Tax Committee. Hello. Uh, 
Chair, Chair Gomez and members of the committee, thank you for having me today and taking the time to listen to me. For the record, my name is Adam Thompson. I grew up in Apple Valley. I went to Apple Valley High School and I live back in Apple Valley today. I'm also an alumnus of Winona State University and I'm here to testify in favor of Representative Hur's House Bill 443. Um, in seventh grade, I got uh, not roped into, but I got into the AVID program and from seventh grade on, I knew I wanted to attend a four-year university, that I wanted to stay in Minnesota, and I wanted to be a first-generation college student in my family. Um, but I also knew, knew that the university had to be affordable. I had a great experience at WSU at Winona, and it's one of the most affor affordable universities in our state, but I still had to take out quite a significant amount of student loans to help pay for my, uh, to pay for the education, even while I was still working in the undergrad. Um, by the time I finished at WSU, I think I, um, you know, I was a little nervous to look and double check the number this morning, but I want to say it was over $45,000 in student loans while working throughout college and not, um, you know, um, doing anything extravagant. You know, I feel very uh, fortunate that my education um, at Winona State has given me great opportunities, like testifying before you guys today, um, but, and also, um, working with um, Minnesota in the, uh, during the initial response to the pandemic and the testing um, and vaccine um, program. But the, you know, my student loan debt is just really a constant financial consideration. It makes it really hard to plan for the future, make decisions on buying a house, <coughs> um, getting a car, where to live, um, you know, having a family. Um, and I know a lot of uh, similar students and, you know, uh, contemporaries are uh, feeling that same level of pressure and as they decide where they want to live, both within Minnesota, but also whether they want to live in Minnesota. And so, you know, growing up, I know um, that Minnesota taught me that, you know, we have a common desire to help our neighbors um, and build our strong communities um, through investing in one another, investing in our communities. And, you know, that's why I'm excited to support Representative Hur's um, bill. Um, this obviously is not going to wipe out the student loan uh, debt crisis in any means, but it would make a substantial difference in a lot of lives like mine and make it easier as I make the next decisions um, to invest in Minnesota. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate your testimony. Um, next up, Jonathan Harms. Welcome to the committee. Thanks so much for being here. Please just introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Chair Gomez, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jonathan Harms and I'm a young homeowner speaking in favor of student debt relief. Financially speaking, I was actually one of the lucky ones when I left college with an education degree. My debt load was low, thanks in large part to the great love and neuroses of my Mennonite grandparents whose quixotic saving habits uh, were shaped by the trauma of living through the Great Depression. Many of my classmates, though, did not have such a lifeline, including my wife, whose debt we shared when we married almost a decade after graduating. She spent six years teaching in a difficult school for a sub-living wage. During all that time, she felt like she was doing something wrong because of how hard it was for us to stretch the paycheck to the end of the month. We learned how powerful debt relief could be when the teacher loan forgiveness program cut her remaining debt in half. We would still be in debt today without it. That relief was decisive in allowing us to finally start planning, saving for a house, which we've now bought, a family, hopefully, maybe, in the future, and, uh, and a future for those child, um, that child or those children that we hope to have. Um, all of our students deserve a fair chance for the future. We want to live in a state where all kids can attend stable, affordable childcare, robust public schools with adequately paid teachers, and a university education that gives them opportunities instead of drowning them in debt. But all these systems are being left to wither or implode without a pro progressive tax code to support them. We fear, my wife and I fear, what future our kids will be left with uh, without that support. I urge you to support a tax policy that supports a majority of your constituents and to support the student loan relief bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, next up, Jubilee Prosser, if you're here.
Welcome to the committee. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I love your hair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Jubilee Prosser. Um, I live in Ward 1 of Minneapolis. I graduated from Augsburg University. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. I graduated from Augsburg University five years ago with, with a Bachelor of Science in Biology. I am also part of the Young Adult Coalition from Isaiah or Faith in Minnesota. Um, and I fervently support the reducing of student loans in any and all capacities. Despite applying for numerous scholarships before heading to college, receiving many of them, um, even a presidential scholarship from Augsburg University itself, which sounds incredibly prestigious and is in fact one of the largest scholarships that they provide for their students besides offering a full ride, um, I still have $28,000 in student loans just from an undergraduate degree. Um, in order to pay off my student loans uh, within the next 15 years, I have to pay the same amount monthly that I'm paying for rent. Um, in a city that is experiencing a crisis of unaffordable rent, by the way, um, so this is a lot of money. Each month, like many of my peers, my generation, millennials, and Generation Z, um, many of my peers, uh, like many of my peers, I struggle to fail and fail to save monthly and contribute to retirement for myself um, due to paying for groceries, transit, health care, um, and other essential living expenses. So student loan debt gets put to the back burner. Even before Biden has relieved us of interest rising, um, it's on the back burner. I'm paying the minimum, minimum payment. Um, I fear um, that student loans will become a fixed part, well, are a fixed part of my life for decades to come and will inform all my decisions. Um, one of the testifiers before me spoke of decisions like planning to have a child, planning to purchase a house, all these um, important uh, essential parts of our lives um, are influenced by $28,000 of debt. Um, some of my peers have you know, up to $80,000 of debt. Um, <clears throat> so uh, me and my peers, uh, the millennials and Generation Z, have seen the rising cost of education in part because we haven't seen state investment to fund the public solutions to our problems. Um, while so many corporations are making record profits, this is really disheartening to see. Um, thank you so much for listening to me today and understanding the urgency of student loan relief. Um, some of you um, may have people in your lives who are feeling this burden right now. Um, and I urge this committee um, to raise the revenue for our lives in general, including um, student loans. Um, and. Raising the revenue for our lives includes numerous things, including a good transit system, fully funding education for um, me and my peers' future children, for, for grandchildren, um, childcare, buy-in for Minnesota healthcare, all of these important things um, essential to us living our lives. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being here and for your testimony. We appreciate it. Representative Hunter Cantrell. Do I call old um, former representatives representative or do I call? No, I'm looking to representative. representative. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. You call former chairman, chairman. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just, uh, just to clarify TBD. That, Madam Chair, you're the boss. <laughs> We're always a chair now. Unless they're senators. Representative <laughs> Joy, I think, has it right here. Um, <laughs> it, it welcome to who you ask right <laughs> That's right. Welcome to the committee, Representative Cantrell. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, so my name is Hunter Cantrell. I'm a former state representative. It's nice to see most of you. I'm kidding. It's nice to see all of you. <laughs> Uh, and I'm here today to, <laughs> to testify uh, in strong support of Representative Hur's bill. Um, I, like many, answered the societal call uh, to pursue a post-secondary education to be able to better myself in the world around me. Uh, while it is absolutely true that not everyone needs to go to college to attain financial stability, uh, it is a barrier to entry for many to, uh, people to achieve the living wages and benefits that they and their families need to rely on. In my case, I will be beginning my medical education in the fall, an opportunity I've worked my whole life for as a non-traditional student. But in order to get to this point in my academic journey, I had to first complete my bachelor's degree. Uh, we have a significant shortage of healthcare professionals, and when the upfront cost uh, to even get to the point of being a candidate for programs is the completion of a degree, or at minimum, several college prerequisites that cost tens of thousands of dollars, it's no wonder why. Similarly, a majority of decent paying jobs, despite the workforce shortage, require bachelor's and even master's degrees, while the salaries for many jobs have completely stagnated, leaving people saddled with student loan debt from which they will not soon be rid of. 
the cost of attending college and therefore the cost of borrowing have grown at an unsustainable pace and Minnesotans are in dire need of fiscal breathing room with respect to student loan debt and accompanying payments that while promising to be an avenue to reduce economic barriers have in turn created new economic challenges for working people throughout our state. Working class people, especially working class young people uh, who likewise pursued college because doing so more often than not is the clearest path to economic stability uh, for us and our families are languishing in the student debt crisis. The uncertainty around student loan debt forgiveness, the impending resumption of payments for public borrowers, and the historic failure of the public service loan forgiveness program that, while well, on paper is a great idea, has resulted in 99% of qualified applicants being denied, all necessitate your strong and decisive legislative action in our state to give new grads and families some relief from this burdensome <coughs> financial anxiety. This bill is one significant measure that the legislature can take to not only acknowledge the student loan debt crisis and its effect on deterring young people uh, and people of all ages from buying homes and starting a family, but to begin to reinvest and put money, <coughs> excuse me, money back in the pockets of working people who give back to our economy and communities every day as a result of their college education. And with that, I thank you members of the committee and I urge your support. Thank you, Representative Cook. Thank you so much, Representative Cantrell, and I look forward to the day when we can add doctor to uh, your list of honorifics. Congratulations on, on your admission to medical school. That's really great news. Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Representative Davis. Representative, Representative outranks doctor. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> we'll be sure to, to uh, note that when we're adding it to your title. <laughs> uh, next up is B. Rosas. Welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. Just note your name as you begin your testimony, please. Awesome. Thank you, Chair Gomez. Hello, members of the committee. My name is B. Um, I am a grad recent graduate from the University of Minnesota. Um, I had a riveting graduation on Zoom in my room, so <laughs> I am here to testify in favor of House File 40 443 um, because, like many others in this country, I am drowning in student debt. Um, during my time at the U, I was a full-time student who also needed a part-time job to help make ends meet. Um, now, I have a bachelor's degree and a well-paying job, and I'm still struggling to make ends meet. Growing up, I was told that getting a degree would secure you financial stability, but I haven't quite achieved that yet. In the span of four months, I've seen my monthly student loan payments go from $500 to $660. This is matching my rent almost. Um, I remember student debt being a topic of conversation when I was in school, and it gave me hope that our leaders and all our makers, just like you all, would be taking initiative to tackle student debt and also stopping the predatory practices of private lenders that took advantage of me and several members of my community mm -hmm. as well. I appreciate um, House File 443 and Representative Her for taking steps in um, improving the tax credits for our students. I hope you all see that increasing the maximum credit limit and also making these credits refundable will help not only me, but also others in our communities who are struggling with student debt. So many of us cannot afford to go back to school. I know that I can't, and I want to. I want to advance my degree and ex expand my knowledge, expand my skills, but the price is simply just not worth it anymore. The fight into making higher education more accessible and less expensive is one that is gonna be ongoing, and I hope that we take the right steps. Learning and expanding our minds should not come at a high price. We need to invest in solutions that not only address the barriers in our education system, but dismantle them. We must invest in our students who thought that going to school would provide stability, but instead has provided uncertainty. I urge you to pass House File 443. Thank you for the time. Thank, thank you for joining us and for your testimony. We appreciate it. Um, next on the agenda, or um, next on my list of testifiers is Marcellus Ifonlaha, or Laja. Please, please uh, correct me on your name when you come up. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the committee. <clears throat> Chair Gomez and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, for the record, my name is Marcella Stefan Laja. I'm a current student at Metropolitan State University, and I also stand before you as a board member of Students United 
and a community board member of Foster Advocates. I will be graduating this December after finish. I'll be graduating this December and after finishing my degree, I plan on converting my full-time internship with Clifton Larson Allen to a full-time job as a private equity analyst. My path to a degree has been a winding one. Um, despite uh, being bounced around in foster care, I made the decision early on in the sixth grade that I wanted to go to college to provide a better, to provide a better house and financial situation for my parents. Um, leaving high school, I went to a semester of school in Ohio, Miami University, and I immediately realized that despite my scholarship and taking all the loans available to me, I cannot afford to complete my degree there. What's more is after coming home to try again, I was informed that the debt I incurred at this school will prevent me from applying for financial aid or enrolling in school here. Hmm. After two years of working two full-time jobs, chipping away at unpaid tuition and student loans while also trying to secure stable housing, um, I was eventually pushed by my social worker to attempt community college and re-enroll at St. Paul College. I had an amazing experience there, and with the help of a scholarship provided by Travelers Insurance, I was able to complete my associate's degree at St. Paul College and look towards my bachelor's. It took resilience to make it that far, a resilience I was only able to muster because of what completing this degree meant to me. And also it came from the help and support of my school, my teachers, and my loved ones. Uh, the scholarship I received is going a long way to make my career aspirations possible, but the student, let, student loan debt I've incurred leading up to this point is still a pen, pending financial burning. As I think about where I want to live and work, possibly pursuing a CPA, and losing financial aid and the grace period. This bill is another incentive to remain in Minnesota and build a family. Something that I as a former foster have been very intentional about in my decision making. Mm. I want to thank Representative Herr for introducing this bill and I hope each of you will support it. This legislation reminds me of the valuable lessons my experience taught me. And that's Minnesota is way better than Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> but really, this is a signal of the value that we as Minnesotans place in higher education and that we will continue to be pioneers and trailblazers and taking steps to address the student loan crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I saw that Representative Herr is excited about you going into finance because she has a background in that as well. So. <laughs> Great. Chair Gomez, can I just yes. say really quick to the testifier, yes. I know this is unconventional, but Please, right, um, I, I wish that we could have passed our foster ed bill that we did pass last year that just came into effect this year, that any child who's ever been in foster care mm -hmm. gets to go to college for free. Yeah. That would have really helped this type of situation that we need to continue to see how all of our work intersects and why it's so important for us to look at issues from multiple perspectives. So thank you for the testimony. Thank you so much for mentioning that, Representative Her. That was a really um, incredible uh, bill that we were able to pass, and I can just say that you know i was i was the chair of the preventing homelessness division for the last two years and one of the things that i learned in that committee that has stuck with me is that of um people who are 16 to 24 years old who are experiencing homelessness 60 percent of them have been in foster care and so it it just really it matters a lot to our state's health and future not just to these individuals, but to us collectively, that we make sure that we support um, people who have been in that system, and you know that it just it matters a lot when when uh, when they're able to to succeed. And so, thank you so much for sharing with us. We appreciate it. Um, so that's the end of of the testifiers. Uh, is there any discussion to the bill? Uh, oh, actually, sorry, I, I have a, a list already. Representative Swadzinski, you are first up, and we'll we'll get you on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just so, so just kind of looking at the the bill. Um, so, would it only be that the, the tax credit only applies to a certain percentage of the uh, interest payments, or will it go after uh, principal as well? Um, Representative Her, we can certainly toss that to uh, Mr. Clayman if you'd like. Uh, we can do that, and, and I just want to say though that from my understanding of the bill, because I've carried this for two years, that it's up to five thousand dollars. So let's say I'm. Like most of these students will pay way more in student loans than five thousand right. dollars, so the credit you get is up to five thousand. And I don't know if that's broken up between, like the interest or the principal part of it, but maybe uh, our staff can add on to that. Mr. Clayman, uh, Madam Chair and Representative, um, I believe it's student loan payments, so it's it would be whatever payment you're making, which would be the principal and interest payment, and then that would be subject into the four limitations that are part of the credit, and then as proposed to be modified. Representative Swadzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there any matching? So I'm just kind of, as it's developed, could you just principally use the $5,000 credit to make your payment? So let's say your payment is $5,000. You would 
receive five thousand dollars is there any uh, in money as far as does the student or former student have any of their own money that goes into the their their payments or is it all funded by the state representative her again we can go to uh mr clayman if you'd like uh, but, well, representatives, uh, thank you, Chair Gomez and Representatives uh, Swazinski. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm the the answer. The question is is not as clear. I mean, it's it's like any other tax credit that you would get for. Um, so like you're already paying your loan. I, I don't know how the taxes will be done the back end, but you know you would identify how much you paid in student loans, and then that uh, would go towards like how you, when you do your taxes. So it's not like. You you know if they reimburse if you get five thousand tax credit you have to put in another additional five you've already paid it in your school loan payment so I don't know if maybe that's clear but maybe if staff if if, if this understanding is different than that. Uh, Mr. Clayman. Yep, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I'm clear on on the exact question. Okay. Maybe Representative Swidzinski, if you could clarify a little thank bit. Maybe. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, my question is whether or not the student actually has to pay you know, like if you're let's, your total total yearly student loan payment is five thousand dollars so the total amount that you you write do you qualify for reimbursement for the state for the entire five thousand dollars under this bill mr clayman uh madam chair representative Suzinski. um so it would I, I believe that would depend on how the other limitations under the student loan credit would play into things so and, and maybe a good kind of way to sort of look at that is to is, is if you look at the table on page two of the house research summary it kind of ties together all those different limitations so you could certainly have you know if you made five thousand in payments um you, you might qualify for the maximum credit or you might not you know for instance there's an income phase out so you might not necessarily be able to take the credit for the full five thousand um, and you could get phased down to zero on that as well and so there are a few other limits that would apply too um, but yeah so it would be you kind of would start with the total amount of student loan payments that you made and then you look at um, all the other limitations you take the lesser of all those limitations and then that's your credit amount Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and then, is there a, a lifetime cap? So, like, let's say I had hundred thousand dollars in student loans, and if this bill would pass, um, and my payment was, you know, for simplicity's sake, over the next twenty years, my payment would be twenty thousand dollars, and that would pay off uh, my my student and my income all stayed within the, the parameters of the bill. Would this essentially pay off your to could could this program, as stated? Uh, pay off your entire interest and principal loan over those 20 years. Representative Swazinski, or I mean, Mr. Clayman, my apologies. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski, um, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think I'd want to go and just kind of crunch some of those numbers to see if, I mean, because my suspicion is you kind of have to sort of hit the nail on the head, you know, in terms of how much income you're making the number of payments you're making what your credit is um in order to get that if you're almost talking about like a hundred percent subsidy mm -hmm. on that so um i, I would i would need to go back and look at that to mm -hmm. to provide a detailed answer to the question but thank you madam chair and just kind of, so so a follow-up so it's not so my question has been answered but it, it's it's not a this is not a question of helping with interest rates this is you're going to not only pay the interest but also the the principal so not only are we you know we're subsidizing on higher education on to the directly to the uh, institution but then we're potentially going to pay essentially and so this could be you want to add a doctorate you want to kind of pay all the way through if you're kind of hit that thing right you essentially could get your whole education paid for on the pack, taxpayers dime 100 percent that could occur Mr. Clayman, uh, I don't know if that was a question or a statement. Was that a statement? I think that, I mean, I, I, I I'm guessing that's, I, I think I'm correct in that assumption. And, and if I'm off base, I guess that's just, yeah, it just seems interesting. So thanks. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to go to Representative Her, Representative Anderson, you're on my list. I just do want to mention that you, you just talked, Representative Swidzinski, about um, the contribute or you know uh, the contribution like basically that the state pays for some of higher education as well as doing this 
But part of the issue with the increasing cost of tuition is that both the state and federal portions of um, higher education that they cover have dropped precipitously over the last, especially the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so what was typical, you know, was that, uh, that, that the feds and the state kicked in to support people getting, um, getting higher education. And since 1999, um, state spending has declined 33% in real terms, and tuition has grown four times faster than inflation since 1970. And so, you know, the sort of the underlying conditions, although the state does contribute to offset the cost of higher education, it really just hasn't kept up with reality, with uh, either with inflation or in, in just kind of keeping that percentage of contributions steady over time. Um, Representative Her. And, and I think that that's a really um, good question. Uh, so Chair Gomez, uh, Representative Swazinski, um, I think that if you just look at the pure math of it, because I think that uh, like student loan terms are usually 10, 15. I think that when I graduated, it was only 10 years you had to repay back your loan, but I've seen up to 30 year terms now. And if you think about it, somebody would have to have a really low income and they would have to not increase that income over a certain number of years. And if you think about it, if you had 30 years to pay for that and you only have $5,000 back a year, that's what is that, 5,000 and 30 is 150,000 dollars. It would take you that long, but if you're thinking about somebody's loan and then it's, it's in, it, it, the interest continues to grow on that. So it's like, it, when you look at just the pure math, there's not gonna be anybody who's, and maybe it's gonna be a really low number, who will actually ever have their complete loan paid off by this. So if you're just looking at the pure math, it would be really difficult to do that. If you think about all the conditions in which would have to be uh, in place in order for somebody to have their entire loan paid through this type of uh, loan credit. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just, just a, maybe a general question to leadership or to you, but you know, it's you know, from looking at the costs of this, you know, we're almost talking about a, almost a half a billion dollars uh, for for credit to kind of help with payment. You know, so rather than kind of pick and choose and create a, a program, and I, I appreciate uh, Representative uh, Davids's leadership on this when it was a smaller amount, but when you increase it to five thousand dollars, maybe I mean potentially maybe something that to, for this committee to really look at is maybe we should just take that money, that substantial amount, and just put it in the higher education. Thank you, Representative Swazinski. I feel like that kind of aligns with. Uh, what I was talking about yesterday, uh, that we can't tax credit our ways out of broken systems. I, I agree with you. I think that we need to spend the, the public dollar on the public good as much as possible. And so to the extent that that translates into, you know, increasing investment in our public systems, um, we're aligned on that. So looking forward to your support on a great higher ed bill as we move forward. Um, we'll put you on the list, Rep Lee. Uh, Representative, oh, okay. 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 We're gonna do. We're gonna. I'm really glad we're having this conversation. We have a number of people on the list. Before we um, move on with it, though, I there's a there's another person in the in the um, audience, I believe, who who wanted to give us a few minutes of testimony. Um, and so, if if that person could come up, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Um, and uh, if you could just introduce yourself at the beginning of your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Sorry that I moved on to conversation without uh, turning to you. Hello. Um, Chair Gomez, members of the committee, um, my name is Rahel Haile. I'm the executive director and co-founder of an organization called Minnesota Youth Collective, um, an organization that builds the political power of young people through civic engagement, issue advocacy, and leadership development. Um, I've spent my whole career working as a young person as, and alongside young people to build their political power to improve their material conditions. I formerly worked at an organization called MPERG, I, along with other organizers, worked tirelessly to pass the original tax credit in front of you, um, a, a bill we called Opportunity Minnesota. We knew that a t student loan tax credit was one small step in addressing the student debt crisis in Minnesota that has been talked about session after session. That bill had a few flaws, and one of the things we knew was that we wanted the credit to be refundable. Um, to put money in the hands of young people that are dedicating so much time, money, and effort into higher education. Now we have the opportunity to do so, and I highly encourage you all to move forward with House File 443 to show that young, show young folks that we are finally ready to address the long-standing issue of the student debt crisis in Minnesota. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your testimony. Thanks for joining us today. All right, so we're going to turn back to member comments and questions. And next on the list is Representative Olson L. We have both Olsons on the committee. Uh, Representative Liz. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I like it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I also was just going to piggyback on the idea of the 709.7 million. I mean, and to your point yesterday, I think was very good that we've heard about childcare and we've heard about student loans today and that uh, this is a way to help, but it doesn't actually address the bigger problems. And I think, you know, a colleague across the aisle did a good job with that point today. Um, but I do have to say that there is like immediate urge. And when I first ran for office and got elected, I did one of those legislative surveys we all do to hear from our constituents. And you feel like you know your district pretty well, right, when you get here. And I was blown away by the response of student loan was the number one thing that was holding my community back. And I don't, I haven't checked the average income since redistricting, but my district's about $58,000 for average household income. It's not a lot of money. And so people making decisions about housing, you know, they're renting longer, they're not having families, everything that our testifiers hit on. So it's, yes, we absolutely do need to do the structural change to make it so people can afford their lives and the urgency of with people surviving day to day and making decisions that will impact them right now. I think the testifiers did a beautiful job. And so I think a lot about that first legislative survey and kind of the need to do both the urgent thing and the long term mm -hmm. thing. And I think we have a lot to balance in that conversation. But I really appreciate Representative Her bringing this bill forward and that we're we're having this conversation here and I appreciate the way the chair has framed this this week um, to put us in that place where we should have tension. Um, but we need to do what we can to improve people's lives now and in the future. And I think this is uh, a good place to start. Thank you. Uh, next is Representative Witte. Thank you, Chair Gomez. Um, would this bill also apply to uh, trade schools? Um, obviously, there is an investment there um, uh, coming out of it. Can they recoup some of this? Uh, would they be a part of it? Representative Her, Madam Chair, maybe I could turn this over to our yeah. uh, our staff uh, to answer this question. Uh, I, I thought that it was any kind of um, post-secondary education, but I want to make sure that I, I don't tell you something that's incorrect. Sounds good, Mr. Clayman. Uh, so, Madam Chair and uh, Representative, um, so the just to restate the question, make sure I have it. So the question is, um, you know, what what are the types of uh, educational loans that this is qual that the you get the credit for? Yes. Is that, um, so it would be it would be eligible loan payments, and my assumption here is that that's defined um, at somewhere in the bill uh, or the existing statutory language. Um, I don't have that <laughs> citation in front of me right now. Um, I can certainly get it get it for you here in in a short amount of time. Um, or hang on. Um, oh, yeah. So trade schools are financed through the Higher Education Act. So those would be covered. So that yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just stuff. Excellent. yeah. Quick work, Mr. Clayman. Uh, Representative Witte. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Gomez. And then the other part of it is um, I appreciate what everyone's saying. I appreciate the testifiers coming in. Um, obviously, uh, um, trying to get ahead in, in life after school and, and this avenue you've taken. Um, but I would like, uh, you know, like even the higher education piece. Um, universities have a, 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 a role in this also. And I think they should be, um, uh, their decisions and how their programs go, um, they have cost and that adds on to these bills. And sometimes they gotta uh, maybe uh, look what is important and provide the education and not what is um, niceties or Xers. So, I think that's a way to also lower these costs so these students aren't coming out with big um, uh, loans and that. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that, uh, Representative Witte. I think if you ask um, any of the lobbyists for the University of Minnesota, they're really happy that I'm not on the Higher Education Committee anymore because I had a lot of questions about um, executive compensation, golden parachutes for, um, you know, departing um, administrators, uh, kind of, there are some, 
you know, pr professors, frankly, at the university that make like $950,000 a year. And, you know, t to have that be the reality of executive or higher level compensation at our state land grant university while tuitions are tuitions going up the 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 burden on students is 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 increasing you know that's a, a really important conversation so thank you for bringing that up yeah representative witty sorry thank you chair gomez one more question would these loans also pertain to parents getting uh if oh, they're paying them off i got uh three daughters I'm paying through school. I think a lot of us all have uh, daughters. Um, I'm just wondering if that would uh, pertain in this uh, bill. Mr. Clayman. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, um, the credit's available for eligible individuals. And again, off the top of my head, I don't know uh, if yeah. that scenario would be covered, but I can get back to you for certain. Yeah. Thank you, Representative Woody. And I do, uh, uh, this is actually our other researcher is out this week so um so mr clayman's kind of pinch hitting for for mr williams he he's sort of our corporate tax guy so we thank you for um for helping us through this and we'll just have to follow up maybe if there's a couple of these details that we have to clarify uh ms templin did you have anything to add uh, great Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to, um, to Representative Woody's question, the revenue estimate was reduced um, accordingly to take out student debt for a dependent. So mm -hmm. that, would, um, that would mean that the, the, um, the student loan credit you know, cannot be used you know, by parents to reduce you know, for student loan debt. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, uh, Ms. Clayman. Um, uh, Representative Anderson, Thank you're you. next. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Chair. Um, it's like, <laughs> sorry, okay, a question to the researchers, I think. Um, so the line 1.11, 1 .1, it uses the word adjusted gross income, 10% of the adjusted gross income, but then line 113 is earned mm -hmm. income. And why are there we using two different terms? And earned income is essentially wages before any adjustments. Mr. Right? Clayman. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Anderson, yes, that's correct. So there's the phase out uses adjusted gross income. So that's like an income threshold for the, the phase out on the credit. And then the, the earned income provision that relates to, uh, I guess to step back a little bit. So you have to have some amount of earned income in order to qualify for the credit. Mm -hmm. So, um, in other words, you have to be working and earning wages in order to get the credit. So that's a second limit limitation that's under there. So they apply, I guess, to two different sets of limitations mm -hmm. and for two different reasons. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. But you would have... Okay, I, I, I guess I understand. Adjust, I mean, you're, you wouldn't have any adjusted gross income if you didn't have any earned income. Mr. Clayman. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, Representative Anderson, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Well, yes, if you had no adjusted gross income, you'd have no earned income. Yeah, yeah correct, yeah. So, or the other way around. Okay. Representative Anderson. Thank you, that's, that's all I had. I just wanted to clarify why there's yeah. two different terms. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it sounds like Mr. Clayman will look into that and follow yeah. up. Good question, thank you. Um, Representative Joachim. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank Representative Her for bringing this bill forward. And funny enough, our son had uh, stopped by back at our house because he still gets some mail there to pick it up, and he's usually not politically active. But he said, you know, Mom, I've been reading some stuff, and I have a question for you. I want your opinion. And I go, what, what about? And he goes, how come we just don't pay for college? Mm. And we talked about how we used to pay for our um, two-year college and tech college and how we're starting to look back at that again. And the cost of college, because he also said, you know, I know you were able to wait tables and pay for your college. And I worked all summers, and I couldn't do that. You guys helped me out. <coughs> and it's a good question for this next generation, because if we're going to value having a degree to make sure that people can earn a living and, and make their way in lives, we should really be doing some of that investing, like you're saying, in our higher ed institutions. And there's been a joke around here for a while, and it's been a while since I've been on higher ed, that we shouldn't be calling it the University of Minnesota anymore. We should be calling it the University in Minnesota because of our lack of investment over the years. But um, I just, 
I, I understand wanting to make sure that students have a skin in the game, but if you look at compounding interest and the fact that the credit's limited and only 17% of a taxpayer's earned income, um, it would be really hard to hit what somebody called that sweet spot. I think it'd be very rare for kids to be able to hit that, especially since most public, public loans are 6% uh, or more, and then private loans go way up from that. And I think um, our researcher just slipped me a good um, good indicator because, like I said, I haven't been in higher ed for a while, that on average public university students take out a loan of $30,000. So college is getting a lot more expensive than when we were kids, and I know I'm aging myself, but gone are the days where you can just work even full-time, or it used to be full-time in the summer and it got you halfway there. Not anymore. So I think this is one piece of the puzzle um, working on it from both ends, and it's kind of a yes and. So thank you, Representative Furr. There wasn't really a question in there, but I just wanted to make a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the, the ability to. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Appreciate it. Uh, Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Chair Gomez, and thank you to Rep Purr for bringing this really important bill up in front of our committee. I also want to especially thank our uh, testifiers today. Um, I especially want to call out Mr. Thompson. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of him for, for being an AVID student and also making his way to college. Um, some folks may not know AVID is a program for students um, where you are identified either in middle school or high school, and y it, you, know, you are very promising and really bright, but you might come from circumstances that that make it impossible for you to go to college. And so um, I, I, want, I want to thank Mr. Thompson for sharing his story and Rep. Her for highlighting the importance of this very, very small tax credit. Um, I, I want to note, right, a lot of our students in college and grad school actually um, you know, go hungry, like Rep. Her said. And so um, I know this because um, I worked hard to make sure that um, our state agencies administering SNAP also reach out to uh, college students and grad students so they know they are eligible, because that is a real concern and um, this is a credit so we have to remember um, these students are working and they use their their wages to pay ahead and collect this money later and so I just want to make those points and, and thank all of the the witnesses who testified today thank you representative Lee one other thing again not to go back to my work on the homelessness committee was I didn't realize I think how many students are facing really uh, severe housing insecurity. So in addition you know, to that, it's kind of like the economic realities that face every working class person face, or that those are the same things that, that our, our college students are facing. And, and I think it's something that we don't often think about is how many people who are, um, who are enrolled in education or in, in higher education institutions face you know, problems getting food, paying their rent, maintaining their place of residence. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Representative Wiener. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to thank the testifiers for bringing up a couple very valid points. And uh, the one that was, that kind of stuck out here is predatory lending. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the responsibility of the colleges. The expectation of having a college degree and using it getting done with college and now not being able to apply that to um, to a viable job and the responsibility of those colleges I think weighs pretty heavily so I do appreciate those discussions today thank you representative Wiener uh, representative Elkins yeah I just uh, want to follow up on um, what uh, Representative Joachim was saying, so I'm, I might be the oldest person at this table. I'm going to definitely date myself by uh, <laughs> remarking that, that when I went to the University of California at Berkeley, the tuition was $212 a quarter. Oh my God. Wow. Okay. So in today's dollars, that would be 14, I just looked it up, $1,438. That's, you know, you pay a lot more than that to go to Normandale College right yeah. now. Yeah, that's right. So we, we actually have a, a Cal Alumni Association here. We, we call ourselves the Frozen Bears. Uh, and uh, one of the games we like to play when we get together uh, is what was the tuition uh, when you went to Cal? And, you know, I'll say I paid $212 a quarter and all of the younger ones, their, their jaws just dropped. You know, I paid $325 a month for uh, room and board. My first car cost $600. And I worked my way through college as a ticket agent and baggage handler for uh, uh, TWA and graduated without any, uh, you know, any student uh, loan debt whatsoever. 
but it, it kills me when I have, you know, talk to, you know, other people my age and, and complain that, well, I paid, you know, I earned my way, worked my way through school. Why can't today's, you know, young people do the same thing? And they can't do it because we're not providing the same level of support that the state of California provided to my public education 50 years ago. Uh, it's just, just, we don't anymore. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Representative Elkins. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. That brings up a good question that I was uh, debating whether or not to ask. Uh, is there a, uh, Representative Herr, is there a prohibition on folks that incur the debt while they're not uh, re Minnesota residents and then they move to the state? Representative Herr. Chair Gomez and Representative Swazinski, I actually asked that question last year and I was told that it is written so that even if you incur the debt at another university, that it would, if you live here now and work here now, that you would get the tax credit. And the, the goal of that is to attract educated, talented people into the state of Minnesota. So, and again, if I research, if I'm saying something incorrect, please feel free to correct me, but that was the information I got last year when the bill was presented. Looks like we got a thumbs up from Mr. Clayman. Yeah. Uh, Representative Swidzinski. And then my, my, my follow-up, Madam Chair, is just, uh, what's the tuition now at Cal State? Yeah. I just looked oh. it up actually. <laughs> uh, it said uh, 38,000, or, or this, so this is for, um, uh, it's in 2022, 2023, if you're living in a campus residence hall, total direct undergraduate costs $38,284. That's, That's a state in, school. In-state. That's an in-state tuition, right. That's right. So, so, for, so for somebody coming from out of state, would it be would different? be way more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Olson B. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just really kind of wanted to go, well, we're talking about this stuff. It's a very serious issue. It affects a lot of people my age, and I will potentially date myself in a way that surprises many individuals. I graduated from high school in 2009, and I graduated from college in 2013. So I graduated from college nine years ago, and I did, in fact, pay for my entirety of my school. So I do not have any student loan debt, nothing like that. So you can perform magical uh, you know, illusions in, in this world today, I, I graduated with, with no student loan debt. So, and I went to a private university that cost $128,000. I worked very hard in high school. I got a lot of scholarships. Uh, my mom, my mom was, uh, didn't have a lot of money, and so my FAFSA score was spectacular, and I received just about as much financial aid as I possibly could have received. So it is possible. Is it something that falls without the, you know, I'm a, a definite outlier, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make sure when we're talking about, you know, I don't want to say elderly individuals, uh, Representative Elkins, but when we're talking about people who are saying it's impossible today, it's not impossible, it's improbable. Uh, Representative Olson L. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just to, I just want to quick respond and lift up and maybe Representative Her, that statistic is true, but not for BIPOC, not for women, not for folks historically at a disadvantaged state. So that may be true, but I think going back to the equity part of that, which is what is really good about this, is the equity focus too. And I just wanted to say that. Um, Representative Her. Or uh, Pin, Representative Pinto had a question or a comment. Should we do that first? Okay, R Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, um, I guess, yeah, similar thought as Representative Olson was speaking. That, I mean, with so much we do with our public policy, we can always point to an outlier or a number of outliers, right? But um, it's... Um, uh, my kids say that everything in my house, the conversations keep on getting back to early childhood policy, and they're there too. Um, so I'm going to do that here, here again. That not just us, huh? It's not just, it's, it's not just you, no, no, no. And they have to live with it. I mean, you only get it a couple hours a day. Um, that, uh, that so much is, it's not, um, it's probabilistic, not deterministic, right? So we know that a child who has a really awful adverse experience when they're young, that's not determined. That doesn't mean that that's the, their course is set. On the other hand, the probabilities work a certain way. Um, and I so much appreciate what what my colleague Representative Olson had to say that, that then when you factor in uh, issues of, of race and gender and, and structural inequities in our society, um, you know, we're, we're playing the odds here, right? So we do have individuals, I'm so glad for you, and let's face it, you, and you're not alone, I'm sure there's other examples of that as well. And we know for a great majority of people, um, this is such a, such a burden that then hurts them, but then hurts the rest of us too. So I'm just kind of thinking in terms of probabilities and not just determine, uh, it's not deterministic, but, um, but it is probabilistic. Thanks, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Representative Pinto. Representative Her. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Committee, for such a robust conversation and the comments. Um, I am very open to however this bill needs to be adjusted. I know that the fiscal note for this is really big, um, but I think that this is a really big problem for us to tackle, but I am willing to have conversations about what, what adjustments need to be made in order for us to get this across the finish line. I just want to wrap up by addressing a couple of things and closing out here, but um, you know, I, I do just want to touch on what Representative Wiener said about um, predatory lending and responsible universities, which you know I, I went to do, my, I'm, I'm just still working in my doctorate. Ten years oh god i hope i finish <laughs> and um and you know when you go through those classes that they do incorporate financial education in a lot of freshmen especially when they come in but i also think that this is where it's really important to support representative hassan's bill on financial education in uh in uh, before you graduate college right that's a bill i carried my first by enemy here and she's done an amazing job these last four years you know also uh, to representative olson at bees um uh, kudos to you and congratulations on being able to do this and you know I'm sure you worked really really hard and I want to make sure that you uh, know that uh, you know we recognize that but I also want to be very clear that's when whole systems work right when when you do see that somebody comes from a low income background or has challenges that when all of the ways in which financial aid works whether it is grants and scholarships and uh, uh, you know uh, all of those put together pays for someone's education that's what, how it should work but it doesn't work like that for the majority of people and so uh, you know we do have to look at why it is that some people are able to and some aren't my children will graduate with no school loans and they've been going for a long time. <laughs> I wish they would just finish. But we also, they also have an enormous amount of privilege, right? Parents who went to college before them, a father who works in the financial sector, which like we make, you know, three times the, the average income in Minnesota here, right? My children will never, and they're gonna be those people who graduate. But that's an enormous amount of privilege. And how does privilege pay out and play out in people's ability to pay for college and people's ability then to, you know, how much debt they have. So I just want us to maybe think about that perspective as well is that, you know, and who the systems have benefited and who they haven't. So like if you're an African-American person whose father didn't benefit from the GI Bill and he couldn't get an education, they couldn't own homes, you've already started a disadvantage of wealth and all of the ways in which things have to exist in order for you to get to the place where you could even go to college and all the disadvantages that were stacked up against you. So I love this conversation. I love how we're all talking about the intersection of the disparities which lead to ability to go to college and then the amount of debt that students take on afterwards. So thank you all so much for that. Um, I just want to say in closing, Saying that um, I want to emphasize what Representative, Representative Solzinski said that um, he's right. We should fund higher education more. We should ask them more questions to hold them accountable. But we should fund them more. But this is not an or issue. This is an and issue, because funding higher education, uh, higher ed institutions now helps the students in college now, but it doesn't help relieve the debt for those who've incurred an enormous amount of money trying to go to college and have a better life. Um, and this is a tool to encourage loan payment. So I think that this is a really good tool for that. And um, I did hear a lot from people from over social media saying that this is like a handout and other people were able to do and pay their own school loans. But the truth is, is that you know, uh, you know, you all have already talked about how uh, much more expensive higher ed has gotten. And I was able to pay off my school loan, even though I struggled and I was a first gen student. But I do want to remind people that when I, when I graduated, I started working in 1995, I had about $20,000 in school loans. And that was, you know, with some grants and some scholarships. Um, and my family didn't have the means to help me out. So there was no support from them. But I was able to pay it off in 10 years. But my first house also cost $83,000 back then. And um, the average home price today is $250,000. And wages have stagnated since 2009, even though we have a worker shortage. And so I would ask for us to look at this holistically and really see how we're building for the future of our state. And that means uh, keeping our talented, educated people here, but attracting them with really great student loan credit programs like this so that we get more, uh, more people into our state to do great work. So with that, I would ask for support of this bill and um, uh, continued conversation. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Representative Her, And um, thanks to all of the testifiers who came. We really appreciate you sharing um, about how this issue impacts you. And, you know, just really, as you can see, it, I, I think that, you know, having your voices here just really contributed to a really rich conversation among members. And so we thank you for for setting us off on that path. Um, and thanks to the members for a great conversation. And with that, um, House File 443 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Tax Bill.